Okay. Here I am again, joined by my dear friend and incredibly knowledgeable encyclopedia of knowledge, uh, the Reverend Dr. Popwin. I was I, I, I going to uh, address you by your proper title because you are the Reverend Dr. Popwin. You know your stuff uh, better than pretty much most people that I know, uh, way better than I probably ever will in terms of your massive theolo theological knowledge. Father, today we're going to be talking about the topic of purgatory, scripture, tradition, why it is important. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing, well, actually, before we even begin, let me ask you, Father, how have you been? Doing well. But I often describe myself as being about as busy as a three-legged dog digging yeah. up a bone. Without a doubt. And I thought I was busy. You are incredibly busy. But uh, you'd have to, you would admit that um, really loving everything you're doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah. But um, stays busy. No doubt. Now, let me ask you this, Father. When it comes to purgatory, as you know very well, because you've done a number of incredible debates, you've written a number of great books, you've touched a number of topics, uh, people tend to um, get confused as to what purgatory exactly is. Now, when we talk about purgatory in, in the Catholic tradition, in the Catholic faith, which is the ancient apostolic faith, what exactly do we mean by purgatory? All right. This it's a very, very important part of the faith. Yeah. Um, this is for the redeemed. It is not a second chance. Mm -hmm. It's not as if, well, I'll try it again. No, no, no. Uh, you get this life is the one life each one of us has. Yeah. You don't get another life. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, it says very clearly in mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, you die once yeah, and then comes the judgment. Uh, there's, I, I've had people who believe in reincarnation try to say to me that, you know, they think they feel like they were here many times. I said, excuse me, what part of once don't you get mm -hmm. this is this is it so uh you die once you don't get a second chance but but it is uh very important to note that there a, a line from revelation chapter 21 yeah. verse 27 this says again very clearly nothing unclean shall enter heaven nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood but only those who are written in the lamb's book of life yep so there's nothing unclean in heaven purgatory comes from the latin word purgare yep. that means to cleanse that's what the word comes from <clears throat> now the word purgatory is not found in the Bible. This is the way Latin Christians, Latin speaking Christians mm -hmm. in the Western part of the Mediterranean world identified it. We'll talk about the biblical terms for it in a few minutes. Yeah. But the idea that heaven admits of nothing unclean. So, the church teaches that for those who are redeemed, people who have lived a life of faith, people who have been filled with hope in Christ. Yeah. And remember, St. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8 that hope saves you. Mm -hmm. So it's not, that's why we don't believe in justification by faith alone. Hope saves you. So does love. And matter of fact, St. Paul speaks about faith working itself out through love. Through love, yeah. In Galatians chapter 5. So faith, hope, and love are necessary. And people who have had faith, hope, and love are those designated among the redeemed. However... 
However, there can be a difficulty. And that is when people who are redeemed in Christ now, Father, still let, let, have let, the effects of sin in them. Uh, let me let me interrupt for one moment, and, and I'm smiling because that's an incredible point. Uh, you, the point, all the points you've made, uh, there's there's a smirk on my face from recalling my days of, of Protestantism. Let me just confirm for you, everything you have just said is indicative that the person must undergo an inner actual change. This is not imputed as as was the one of the uh, banners of the Reformation. This is right. an actual intrinsic change, right? Exactly. Incredible. Uh, here's here's the way Martin Luther talked about salvation: that Christ covers you over with His grace, the way snow covers a pile of dung. Yep. Now that's His image. Now, and it's a anybody who's been in the German uh, countryside knows exactly what he's talking about because German farmers have these outdoor boxes. They're made out of stone yeah. on the corner of their barns. And they put cow manure in there. And in fact, it's a double mm -hmm. uh, image of pride because A, the more manure you have, the more cows you have. <laughs> and the more manure you store, the more fields you have to manure. Yep. And so Luther is being very clever here by saying our pride in possessions and accomplishments is like those German farmers showing off their manure. <laughs> and so, you know, there are vulgar ways we will stay far away from yeah. but it's his image for the riches that we accumulate in this world well our lives are like that manure and he he said he wrote that christ covers it over like snow and yeah. you know i lived in a village in B bavaria called kochel am See. oh you did and yeah and you see these boxes all over. It was great, you know, because, I mean, I had an idea of farm life, but, you know, seeing how the Germans do it in the very orderly way mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, that's just uh, one part of life. And, and it snowed. I arrived in May, but I was in the Alps, so it was still uh, snowing every day. And you just see the manure get covered over. That's yeah. his image. Yep. Now, the Catholic point of view would say, all right, all of, you know, our accomplishments may be manure and our sins are manure and things like that. But instead of covering it over, we believe that Christ puts that manure into the soil. He gets it into the depths and plants roses that transform the manure into beautiful, sweet smelling flowers. That's transformation in Christ and not merely covering over. And I think that's a very, Luther took, you know, he had set out to become a lawyer. Uh, his father wanted him to be a lawyer. His father was very, very upset that he yeah. became a monk, but he wanted him to be a lawyer. And so he still had some of that legal approach to life. And he saw justification through the lens of the law court and that Christ simply decrees you to be uh, forgiven, which is true. But as we see in the way that our Lord related with the apostles, he just, just didn't say, oh, you're forgiven. It's okay. Mm -hmm. No, he kept correcting them. Sometimes addressing them harshly. Oh, you men of little faith. And or, or get behind me, Satan. I mean, he could be very direct and a bit rough. But it was to transform them so that instead of the cowards 
who ran away and denied him on Holy Thursday, mm -hmm. they become bold preachers of Christ on Pentecost. Yeah. This is transformation that Christ wants to accomplish. Now, in heaven, that transformation will have to be complete. So when we, you know, we can be forgiven of our sin. I think of a lot of the people that you may know and I know in my life um, that did you wrong. They mistreated you. And you say, all right, I forgive them. But sometimes it just takes a little bit of remembrance of it and, and you still boil. Now, you may have forgiven them, which mm -hmm. is an act of the will. Right. But there still is this reaction against them. And as a result, you have to have that effect of your sin, that that way, the way that emotionally the resentment remains within us. That has to be cleansed. You cannot bring that feeling of resentment to heaven. There's no room Correct. in heaven for it. Correct. None. Or, you know, so many people have uh, sexually lustful thoughts. Mm -hmm. People look at the internet. And many people struggle because it becomes yeah. very addictive. Sure. This is a reality. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I hear this a lot in confession. People are truly sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they really are. But there are times, even right after confession or later on, where they still have that tug back to those images that are still running around their minds. Yeah. You cannot bring those images into heaven. Yeah, correct. You can only bring a love for those people. You should never, uh, and, and this is something very important, you never hate yourself because you you had lustful thoughts and you don't hate the people you looked at in porn. Instead, yeah. what I usually give as a penance is that people pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet to pray for the people you were looking at improperly. Right, rather that's than... Part, that's part of the transformation yeah. a person needs to go through. But it, those thoughts that still come back have to be purified. Yeah. The desire that an alcoholic might have to get drunk again or to get high again on a drug and they yearn for that, that has to be purified. And that's what purgatory is about. The sins are forgiven, but the effects of the sins still need purification that's what purgatory is about now father you have done a number of magnificent debates um <clears throat> and indeed as i've been telling you for well over a well over a decade um your debate well, actually uh, i started doing debates in public i mean i've always been argumentative <laughs> so that's my my siblings but the i, I did my first public debate Back in uh, 80, 88, I think wow. it was, yeah, 87 or 88 with wow. Walter Martin. Yeah, you did incredible in those debates. Um, uh, and, and your debate debates have been inspiring me for a very long time. Those are great debates where you uh, essentially, I, 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 I disagree. You didn't debate Walter Martin. You debated Walter Martin and you debated Ankerberg because they ganged <laughs> up on you. They gained up on you, um, but you held yeah. your, your, your composure. You did fantastic in those debates. And you bring up a number of very good points there that I think people don't realize with purgatory. People will complain and will say, what on earth is the good news about purgatory? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If I know that I am going to be saved, that's pretty good news. If I'm going to have to undergo purification, but I don't have any opportunity of losing my salvation because I am saved. I just need to be purified before entering into heaven. That is part of the good news, isn't it, Father? Yeah. Uh, here, think about, um, you know, 
say you're a coal miner and you're what you, you come out of the mine and you find out that president biden is coming to your home mm. would you say well i'm just going to show up covered in you know cold smudge or am i going to go clean up the best i can i would even want to yeah. get in under my fingernails i want to get behind my ears i want to make sure that i'm cleaned up to see him yeah because that's the president of the united states you would do your best to be all cleaned up and i think this is even more true for the state of our soul in heaven yeah. when you see god himself President Biden is a fallible human being. Mm -hmm. We honor the president and all that. But, you know, he's a sinner like the rest of us. And we would honor his office and clean up. But if it's God, our Lord, I really want to be cleaned up. I don't want. And, and, and again, heaven will not admit Mm -hmm. any of those bad thoughts of revenge anger lust drunkenness none none of these sins have or their effects will be in heaven you won't have the slightest desire to go back to the old slop yeah those are those are great great points now one other thing that does come up so often father uh, probably more often than anything else would be um people and rightly so look at the writings of the magnificent early church fathers and we note how varying from father to father uh <clears throat> you may have different depictions of what purgatory is varying right. from father to father right. and in my opinion that there's my opinion has always been this perhaps the purgatorial experience may vary from person to person um maybe it will be perhaps uh, instantaneous for one other person that had uh, was lived a greater holier life uh, maybe it would be uh, mm -hmm. uh something that would take a bit longer for someone like myself who was a work in progress the point being when it comes to the purgatorial experience the church has never dogmatically defined and said it is gonna be this way for everyone right have they, father Right. No. no, no. As a matter of fact, at the Council of Trent, mm -hmm. the fathers there warned against trying to paint too lurid a picture of how bad it'll be. Mm -hmm. It's, um, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll focus on the uh, flames that purify. I think I, it, it, I don't know what the pain will be like i don't know yeah. i do think you're right that it'll be adapted to the needs of each person yeah this is why i would strongly urge people to read dante yeah in his divine comedy the second part is the purgatorio most people read the inferno about hell and when you get to read dante in a literature class most professors focus on hell and they they deal with the way he describes sins and why people are there and it's brilliant it's, it's not only beautiful poetry uh the italian has a wonderful wonderful uh, uh rhythmic pattern to it that's just if you learn no italian uh that's a very very good book to read but it is something that uh you can you need to read the purgatorio and it's not a bad idea to read the paradiso too about heaven but yeah. you know in the purgatory you see different kinds of people are experiencing different ways of purification mm -hmm. it's not one size fits all and dante was doing this on the basis of understanding saint thomas aquinas he was putting thomas's teachings 
into poetic form. So that's one of the reasons that it's extremely good to read him on the purgatorio and the different ways that people suffer in purgatory because it's as you he portrays it the way you say that mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, penitential and purgatorial uh, experience is adapted to the needs of different kinds of sins. Now that <coughs> those are all very good points, Father. I I also remembered the incredible deuterocanonical book of, of Second Maccabees. Now, yeah. now uh, here's the, the one thing that even if we, we recognize that our evangelical friends um, don't accept that book in the canon, and they should because it's part of the Bible from the beginning, uh, right. part of the Greek Septuagint as well. Um, when we talk about Second Maccabees, even if we look at it from a strictly historical perspective, what has got to blow the people away that are reading it is the fact that Judas Maccabeus stumbles upon his fallen army, stops, and he and his men pray for the dead. He didn't stop and say, well, we're going to do something completely novel and new. It, it seemed to me, Father, from my reading of the text in English and in the Greek, uh, this was common for them already. There was no objection to praying for the dead. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, uh, the, the episode is in 2 Maccabees chapter 12, mm -hmm. uh, beginning with verse 39. And you see that um, Judas went and got the to bury the bodies mm -hmm. of the soldiers who had fallen in battle. Fallen because they were defending their Jewish faith, defending mm -hmm. belief in the one God. But then when he went to get their bodies, he found under the, their tunics of every one of the dead, the images of the idols of Jamnia. Yeah. And so they were wearing these amulets, and it says in verse 40, this was why these men had fallen. Because yeah. they're fighting for the Lord, but they also had these amulets you know magical amulets under their clothing and you know it's just it would be like catholics today who look at their horoscope in the newspaper mm -hmm. and things like that yeah um you know th this is something that is problematic familiar. yeah right. problematic no doubt um, yeah, no, yes well it's a sin against the first commandment it is and yeah. it says so uh, th their result, th their reaction was to bless the ways of the Lord, the righteous uh, judge, who yeah. reveals the things that are hidden. But then, after they realized this was, they, they suffered because they had put themselves in the enemy side by having these, and God punished them by having them die. But then the response was not to say, nah, see, I told you so. No, they didn't do that. Instead, they turned to prayer, beseeching, and this I'm quoting, beseeching yeah. that the sin which had been committed might wholly be blotted out. And Judas, uh, noble Judas, exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin. And then they took up 2,000 drachmas of silver in the collection to mm -hmm. provide for a sin offering. And in doing this, it says, he acted very well and honorably taking account of the resurrection. Yeah. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous yeah. and foolish to pray for the dead. But if he was looking to the splendid reward laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. So making an offering, making a sacrifice for the dead and praying for them, that's what we see in 2 Maccabees 12. Yeah. That's what scripture calls us to. And, you know, they, the people in purgatory, have to be purified passively in this life we can be purified more actively we can take on 
penances and such and take and do that but in purgatory it's more passive um and it's a role of grace but we here on earth can pray for them mm -hmm. and that's what we do um you know ju just i just found out yesterday that uh, a priest friend of mine 90 years old who had uh served as a chaplain in vietnam and then got his doctorate in theology and taught at the seminary level for decades he just died at, at, at age 90 so i offered mass for him this this is what yeah. we do of course and which is which is um as we read there in second maccabees a holy and a pious thought and it was common, very, very common in the right. Jewish texts, uh, common amongst the early Christians as well. So if you find it, prayer for the dead being common in the earliest Christians, those that were taught and trained by the apostles, um, that were taught and trained by our Lord, well, then this is a pretty good indicator that this is an apostolic practice of praying for the dead. So it, it baffles me, Father. This is one of the things that when I converted to Catholicism, uh, I'd be honest, it took me a long time to shed off all of my Protestant skin. It took me a while to feel comfortable asking for the prayer and intercession of the saints of Holy Mary. Now, of course, I, I, I love it. I realize we're the body of Christ. We're connected. And as the, as the book of James says, uh, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. So it's a beautiful thing that we have this in our apostolic Catholic faith. It's a wonderful thing. I, I also think of 1 Corinthians 3, which, as you know very well, uh, was a text hearkened to by a number of early church fathers, uh, and a text indeed which is magnificent. St. Paul is uh, he's upset at those, at those sneaky uh, um, Corinthians that they, they can't get their stuff in order. And hey, everybody's being martyred every day. St. Paul would know because he was one of the ones that was murdering the Christians before he converted. So he's exhorting them to get to stop being factious, stop living divisive lives in 1 Corinthians 3. And around 10, between 10 to 15, he gets to the point of where he is talking about the day, which we know is Judgment Day. And he talks about, uh, he gives an example of it, depending on how you lived your life with uh, gold, silver, or precious stones, uh, which are clearly representative of good works, or wood, hay, and straw, which are representative of bad works, which would be sinful. But he gives an imagery, Father, that has always really blown me away, and as a Protestant, perplexed me, because it didn't fit into my Protestant theology. That imagery of a man in the afterlife, post-mortem, being saved, judged by his works, but he has to go through the fire. He is saved, yet so as through fire, fire, dia paras, through fire. Father, that screams purgatorial to me, and yet it didn't fit into my mindset as a Protestant. Uh, maybe if you could talk about that a little bit. It clearly did imagery there. It's very purgatorial, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I think um, to have a clear sense mm -hmm. of, you know, why that is so important, um, I, I think is key. Yeah. That St. Paul, in, in that passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, even says about himself that, uh, that well, let me just read some of the passage. Yeah. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation mm -hmm. and another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. For no other foundation can one lay than that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. So first, this is very important. Jesus Christ is the foundation of our Christian life. Yep. And I am so concerned that a lot of people take Christ for granted. They don't focus on him. Mm -hmm. They don't have a, a, a strong relationship with him. They also don't have a knowledge of him in the scriptures. 
Yeah. You know, they don't know what he taught. And that is the foundation. There is no other foundation. But then you can build a foundation is not the goal of a building. It's mm -hmm. the start of a building. So Christ yeah. is the foundation and then you build upon it. Now, uh, this is what we have to pay attention to. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become manifest. Now, this is talking about the various qualities of effort that a Christian takes in building their own lives yeah. and in serving other people. Some give a perfunctory $5 on uh, Sunday for the collection, which, you know, doesn't really help a parish float. Not at all. It costs more than that. And I say that because I'm not a pastor. I've never <laughs> been pastor of a church. But I empathize because they have huge bills. Uh, yeah. And so the two bucks or five bucks that you paid back in the 1950s is not quite enough to keep a church going today. Inflation affects churches too. So that's just a little side point. But you can just give something very simple. You can do a bare minimum as a Christian, that would be wood, hay, and straw. Or you can give your whole life. So, for instance, if you're married, you live your marriage in Christ. He's the center of your marriage. That's building your marriage with gold and silver. And that you love your spouse in Christ. You love your children, not because they'll make you better known, but because they serve Christ. This is our task. And each one of us has to understand whatever I give the Lord, whatever I build with on top of the foundation of Christ, St. Paul goes on to say, each man's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it yep. because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Now, he goes on to explain, if the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So if you live your Christian life on the cheap and you just sort of do the bare minimum, you will be tested in fire. This is one of the reasons why, uh, from this passage here, that purgatory often is understood to be yeah. a fire. But you, your work will be tested. If you put silver, gold, or precious stones in a fire, they will not get burned up. They will not turn to carbon. Yeah. But straw, wood, and hay will be carbonized. They will, they will turn into carbon. Um, and what you think you've done will be lost. Well... If we are, uh, and here's the goal. The Lord wants us to be filled with treasure in heaven. This is, yeah. uh, I would connect this with our Lord's teaching about building up treasure in heaven by what you give away to the poor. Yeah. What you give away, that's your treasure in heaven. And that treasure will be counted as gold, silver, and precious stones that will survive the fire. So this is a very, very important element. Durable work will endure the purifying fire. 
non-durable work will not. Now, you'll still be saved. Right. But it's, and that's why this is important. This is he's clearly not speaking about hell. Correct. He's, He's speaking about something that you you are saved, but you'll be purified by fire. Yeah, you can't be you can't be saved in hell. You won't be. No, you will not no, be saved no, in no, hell. No, there's, there's no second chance. No. In hell, uh, you are there for forever. Yeah, that is uh, the, the 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 forever has been the teaching of the Catholic Church. You you do not get well, a second it, chance. And and you know it does come from Jesus. Amen. Without so, a doubt, uh, he, yeah. Uh, you know, Saint Paul never mentions hell, mm -hmm. but our Lord mentions it often. Yep. Especially in the Sermon on the Mount, and in his parables. So this is very very important to Christ in his teaching. Now, there's something I'd like to bring up at this point, if I may. For sure, without a doubt. And that is, where is this in Scripture? We, well, we've already been getting at it mm -hmm. by talking about praying for the dead and yeah. also speaking from 1 Corinthians 3 about purification. That's already showing us that there is this purgation after death. But where else do we see it? And the most important place is in first peter chapter 3 now i'm going to start this in verse 18 mm -hmm. it says there for christ also died for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit so this is the first starting point uh, that St. Peter gives. Christ died for our sins. And it's very important to see that the doctrine of purgatory does not deny that. It doesn't weaken it. Rather, it is based on it. Yeah. That Christ died for sins once for all. He doesn't die again and again. He dies once. It's just that he, because he's God who made man who died, the power of his death is able to reach through the millennia. He can keep on, uh, his death is represented to us in all the sacraments, especially mass, but yeah. in all the sacraments. So that's a very important thing. That, that, that's then, a very yeah, important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. But then it says, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, by spirit, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit. This mm -hmm. is referring to his human spirit. Christ, mm -hmm. as a full human being, has a human spirit. That's part of being you know, fully human. Uh, sometimes people try to say that the divine person took the place of a human soul. No, he has a, a human soul and human body. And he is also 100% God. It's yeah. just that having a, a, a spirit or a soul is part of what it means to be human. So he took it yeah. on. So he was made alive in the spirit in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Yeah. Who formerly did not obey when God's pa patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few that is eight persons were saved through water. Now, this is very important that uh, his human spirit descended to this prison when we pray the creed we oftentimes say he descended into hell yeah now you have to be alert that the word hell 
has different meetings at different times in English. Correct. In Old English, Helle was the word that meant the place of the dead, what the Greeks called Hades. Hades, correct. And what the Hebrews called Sheol. Mm -hmm. It was not a place of reward, nor was it the condemnation place, the place of damnation. It was neither, it's just where souls went. It was, they were not happy, but it wasn't condemnation in hell. Mm -hmm. And hella was the old English word for that. Later on, as English developed, hell came to mean the place of the damned. Mm -hmm. But it was not that in the early part. So when it says he descended to hell, they mean he went to Hades. And in fact, mm -hmm. in Greek, the word is Hades. So that's yep. just a little side point. But here, instead of calling it hell, St. Peter calls it the prison. Mm -hmm. And this is where our spirits. Now, why is it called the prison? Because that is the way that the book of Job describes Sheol yeah. as being like a prison. You can get in, but you can't get out. And that way, it's like a roach hotel. You, uh, <laughs> you, you, you can check in, but you can't check out. Now, yeah. that's, that's a very important part so that we see this is not heaven because Christ had not yet opened the kingdom of heaven. But they're not in hell. And he is able to preach to those spirits in yeah. prison. All the people who died before his crucifixion. And that's what he says. You know, the people who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few that is eight persons were saved through water. And then he goes on to say, by the way, just to point out in verse 21, that this is a sign of baptism yeah. because baptism now saves you. It's good. I mean, we're not going to talk about baptism today, but it's good to remind ourselves that baptism now saves us. Yep. Yeah. Regenerative. Yeah, it is. It's not. Uh, and, and it doesn't say you're baptized, therefore you're saved. No, you're in the process of being saved. Yeah. And so the, the whole life of Christ is one of transformation. But you need baptism as yeah. much as possible. So and especially that's important for those people who don't want to baptize their own children. Um, you got to do that. You have to do that. <laughs> and you have to train them in the faith. And yeah. Morals. Without so, a doubt. Baptize your babies, people. You got to do it. Yep. Now, to go on to the next uh, part. Um, I like to connect this verse with Matthew chapter 5. Mm -hmm. Beginning yeah. with verse 25. I know where you're going. Yeah. It says, make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with them to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, the word for prison that our Lord uses here is the same that St. Peter uses. Mm-hmm. And notice that you will be put into prison and you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. But you can get out. Yep. But you have to pay for you know injustice. Um, and in this case, it's for holding grudges. So yep. this is something that um, is very important that a Christian who holds a judge, a grudge, can't bring that grudge into heaven they mm -hmm. need to stay in the prison until they pay the last penny that yep. it would be the way they speak about purgatory that that is those are incredible examples father indeed i'm reminded of uh you, you went over first <laughs> corinthians you went over matthew chapter five and, and incredibly enough i'd recommend people go and read the uh letters of the great saint cyprian who uh, combines the the language of both 
Matthew 5 and, and 1 Corinthians to talk about purgatory talks about it as a uh, as a kind of prison, post-mortem prison as well. Uh, multiple fathers utilize that kind of language. Multiple interpreted Matthew 5 in a purgatorial sense. One other thing, Father, that perhaps you get asked this a lot, or perhaps you don't, but one thing that comes up so often, especially during this time leading up to Halloween, is that question of people will ask, they'll say, okay, well, we are all, we're in the Halloween season. What about ghosts? Are ghosts, are there such thing as good ghosts? Are they demonic? Are they souls from purgatory that are, that are uh, undergoing some kinds of suffering? In your experience, Father, of being a, a magnificent priest for so many years, and you hear about the topic of ghosts, have you encountered the idea that, that they are perhaps souls that are still undergoing purification? Or would you say, look, the majority of ghosts are probably, uh, you know, bad spiritual forces, evil. Uh, what are your I, thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've definitely heard people uh, speak about both aspects right and you know and we have to be careful about our speculation mm -hmm. um if you don't know something it's really a good idea to admit that no doubt um pretending not to be ignorant when you are mm -hmm. is not a good idea yeah no doubt. And, and really, there's really no way to know. Yeah, exactly. And, now, and, uh, yeah, here's uh, a couple things. I have come across some people who try to say that, uh, who pray for those who have died. Yeah. And they very much want to um, uh, have this sense of praying for the dead and that some of the experiences of you know haunting and stuff comes to a stop when they have masses offered and by the way what's interesting about that is some of this comes from uh non-catholics wow you know um there was a non-catholic psychologist who was quite big on you know making sure that you pray for the dead mm -hmm. uh, and and so this is which is a good thing now when it comes to this um a couple things mm -hmm. i think it would be better to uh, like i said don't speculate right that just gets you nowhere. Um, if there is something uh, about other spirits and such, all right, we'll try to deal with that. But I don't think that it's good to speculate. Instead, simply pray for the dead. Yeah, This is an act of charity. No doubt. And I would urge people to live out that kind of charity um you know focus on the good of the dead and not what you're going to get from them yeah that would be my strongest recommendation and it's a biblical recommendation as well because you're not trying to conjure up the dead that is condemned in, in right Deuteronomy. yeah you're not trying yeah, to conjure up not you know you may not have any contact with the dead yeah. don't try to no seances those are mortal sins mortal that's correct those are mortal sins without you, a doubt you just no. don't do that kind of thing with impunity you know show respect for the dead pray for them but don't try to uh get any kind of idea that you can go ahead and um do something um you know for the dead that uh is not proper for you to try yeah just stay stay clear of that now 
we've been talking about, we've covered and covered a number of incredible topics, Father, and you've been incredibly, incredibly clear. And I'd like to ask you one final question before we wrap up um, this evening. We're, we're, we're coming across, we're coming up to Halloween, which of course, as people know, it's yeah. All Hallows Even, All Hallows Evening, right before All Saints and All Souls Day. Right. People frequently ask me, Father, okay, is, is it okay to dress up? Is it okay to go trick-or-treating? Is it okay to celebrate? Now, and how, as, 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 a, as a Catholic, how would you answer the audience when people tune in and they ask, well, how about trick-or-treating? Is that okay? What are your thoughts on that? Is there a positive aspect to this? You know, I grew up in a very different era. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Halloween was so much fun. Yeah, we still didn't is for me. <laughs> quite get as much candy and stuff as people do today. It was a little bit, you know, more restrictive about candy. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't have uh, a whole lot. So Halloween was a time when you got more candy and yep. uh, drove your parents crazy, which is a big part of the fun of it. Mm -hmm. no doubt <laughs> you want them to be just driven a little crazy mm -hmm. uh by now you guys can't eat that candy now <laughs> put that away yeah save some for another day yep <laughs> i can still hear my dad especially <laughs> um but uh then we also have to uh, realize that today that there's a dark quality I, I heard on a television program that people, that one of the popular uh, masks today is a Jeffrey Dahmer mask. Yeah. yeah. That, that, there's nothing fun about that. No. What did he do? That man more, lured young men monster. to their death. Yeah. And then froze them and ate their bodies. I mean, this is not I princesses cowboys outer space guys one of the most clever costumes I ever saw was on my nephew my <laughs> sister made him a costume where he was a walking christmas tree wow it was very clever he won the uh first prize in contests everywhere he he did it for about three years in a row and he won wow. the first prize nobody thought of being a christmas tree uh so i think she used different size hula hoops with you know you know decorations coming off so that was cute and and you go around getting candy and people just have kind of fun but now I, it's not so much fun and i'm also staunchly staunchly against adult Halloween parties because mm -hmm. adults are not looking to get candy. Right. It's usually a, a time for drunkenness and yeah. fornication. Yeah, no doubt. A lot of sex and drinking that goes on. Yeah. Um, you know, getting into sexy outfits and like that. I mean, th there's, I can remember my parents would go to Halloween parties and they had fun doing it. And it was just hanging out with their friends and there was nothing sinister. Today, it's gotten very sinister. Sure. And I don't like it. I, mm -hmm. I am staunch against that. Kids going walking around for trigger treat uh, is fun. Again, today, we have to have great care because there, there's, we, we hear of risks that you could get fentanyl. You know, they're wow. shaking fentanyl like candy yeah. Yeah. and coloring it like past candy, uh, pastel candy. This is no game. These no. are murderers. Yep. These are murderers who are, you know, people don't try to get high on fentanyl. It is put into different drugs and it's a poison. These drug dealers and drug cartels are poisoning our nation Kill over a hundred thousand a year so we have to be extra cautious that we trust the people to whom we go with kids if you're yeah. going to go trigger treating 
No doubt. Um, so those would be some of the things that are my own reflections. I don't. I I think a lot of churches have trunk or treat, where instead yep. of going to houses, people you trust bring candy. Um, I still miss. I you know it, it was fun in our day because there were some of the women in the neighborhood that made popcorn balls. I used to love popcorn balls. <laughs> you know they they it was just. It was fun stuff. It wasn't just the same old Snickers, the Musketeers, and Twix. You know, it was it was fun to get different kinds of candy, and some of it was homemade. If we didn't know where it came from, my parents would throw it away. But yeah. if it was people we knew, which is most of the neighborhood, yeah, we ate it because we knew those people. Mm -hmm. And we knew Luigi and Guido, so it fixed <laughs> the kneecaps if there was anything wrong. Yeah, there you go. That's you but go. that's only Chicago. <laughs> that those that's um great advice. You you're right there. What I what I like dressing up as Halloween. Uh, I I the past few years I've dressed up as uh, Blessed Dun Scotus, uh, Great Marian Monk. So hey, I I like dressing up, but hey, I'm not doing anything. I'm not dressing up as a diabolical figure. Um, right, and, and I'm oh, not going or to or as some. Uh, sexy vixen or something. Yeah, you know that it. This is not the time to seduce you to sin. No, no. This is a time where we pray for the dead. We first of all we remember the saints. Yep. That's why That's it's it all Hallows. That is all Saints Eve. Yep. yep. And I know some parishes have the kids dress up as different saints, and then they have to explain something about the life of that saint yeah or even write a poem about that saint in order to get the candy yeah it's not just this uh strong arm routine where you're going door to door trick or treat either give me a treat or do a trick no yeah. you have to do the trick you have to explain the life of the saint and tell their story and kids enjoy that too you know, little boys that want to be soldier saints, they can do that. They can be martyrs. They can have all kinds of things, you know, that you can do. I don't know if there's a cowboy saint. I always went as a cowboy when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, why don't you read something else? I said, nope, wanted to be a cowboy. Some kids haven't gotten over that. <laughs> now, one of the things that I... I still I wear my boots and hat and belt. And, and and you you should because it's fun it's great it's I mean, here's here's the one thing I, I don't mean for Halloween that's just no, what no, I wear. no 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 I, I was about to say you regularly oh I know that you I know that you love wearing your cowboy hat I know that <laughs> I know that and you love hunting for people that may not know Father Pacwa is an incredible hunter is an incredible hunter Father before we we wrap up I, I I'd like to to uh, the, the one thing that does come up so often when it comes to purgatory has the church defined that there is an actual amount of time or do we simply no. not understand that the concept of time in the afterlife right there's no, there's no uh temporality in purgatory right. now some people get confused because they would see that there were indulgenced mm -hmm. prayers yeah. that had 300 days indulgence, a year indulgence, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you have to understand what this was about. Yep. In the, the Irish missionaries to Europe were dealing with a rough crowd. They were evangelizing the German ancestors uh -huh. of most of Europe. And these were barbarians. Right. Rough, rough guys and gals. You know, some of them rode around with human heads at the end of their spear. I mean, this, yep. is, this is not your nice group. So they gave very strong penances. So if you committed adultery, the penance, the standard penance was 21 years on bread and water. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That might make you think twice. No doubt. Yeah. Before you, you, you have a fling. It's not something cheap. 
It's a serious thing. Well, the indulgent, that, that's tough penance. The indulgences, say 300 days indulgence, was 300 days off of that 21 years on bread and water. Mm. Wow. So on earth, there is time. Correct. In purgatory, there isn't. So when you were given a penance of seven years on bread and water for certain kinds of stealing, things like that, yeah. the prayer was a year off of that. Uh -huh. So that's what was going on. Yeah. That's Does that make sense? A hundred percent makes sense. And it really does clear up the confusion. A lot of people may think that, oh, okay, well, I'm going to pray and it's going to take two, three, four, five years off of purgatory, off of my loved one uh, who's undergoing this kind of post, this undergoing this post-mortem suffering. And yes. that you have cleared up that misconception. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, a lot of people don't know that, but I know this show will reach a lot of people and a lot of people will understand that very clear distinction now and understand that we stick to the clear parameters of what has been defined by the church. That's very clearly. And everything we've covered today has been has been the teaching of purgatory as defined by scripture. And this is what I always say, Father, as the church defines according to what is laid out in scripture and sacred tradition. It's real simple as that, isn't it? Yep, it's, it is. It is. Now, and, as, as, and this uh, is where, you know, the church doesn't just sort of make something up. Yeah. See, you'll get cynics. Uh, and you remember Archbishop Sheen's definition of a oh, yeah. cynic. It's someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Yep. And cynics will say, oh, they just made this up so they could get money for indulgences. No, no, no. This came from careful study of scripture. The perversion of selling indulgences, which, by the way, was forbidden by the Council of Trent. Yep, sure was. Um, that was a reform that needed to be done. Um, but, you know, the, this, and it was done. But the belief in purgatory comes from very careful reflection on sacred scripture. Yep. And this is what we all have to do. In, in one sense, careful meditation and attentive meditation on scripture yeah. would be some of the gold and silver and precious stones with which we build. No doubt. We all have to remember that so that we don't live as superficial Christians. We live in a society that is not neutral toward us. Mm -hmm. Our society is becoming more aggressively anti-Christian. We see this year, well over 200 churches have been attacked. And the FBI refuses to investigate this. These mm -hmm together would add up to hate crimes yep. and they refuse to look at it. Whereas they harass pro-life people all the time, pro-life clinics. They are against us. They are not neutral. And some States like New York, and I think Michigan is pretty nasty on you know going after pro life clinics these the, the the governors and other leaders of those states have stated that they are going to try to shut down pro life clinics these are not neutral people yeah, not at all during covid the governor of michigan shut down churches but kept liquor stores and marijuana stores open Outrageous. These are not neutral people. No. And because of that, we have to be all the more knowledgeable of our faith. We have to, we cannot sort of float along like a twig 
in a Christian cultural river. Yep. That's been dried up and diverted. Now we have to walk yep. on our own two legs, knowing scripture, knowing Christ, having a lively prayer life, preparing for the next life. This life is short. Very. The next life is is eternal we have to prepare for that and not make ourselves superficial or fearful and able to be manipulated yeah. these people the world will manipulate us with fear and they will attack us so we just have to be ready for it and father i want to say that you're incredible presentation today we'll have people ready to know and talk about what purgatory is father i've been incredibly edified by your time uh your magnificent knowledge the way you've broken down scripture sacred tradition i want to give you a moment to put in a plug for anything you might be working on you want to direct people towards something anything on your mind father no, the floor is yours no I, i'm not handling anything <laughs> Despite being the son of a used car salesman. No, but no, no. They've got to they've got to tune into your show though on EWTN. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd certainly watch EWTN live on Wednesdays, uh, which is eight o'clock Eastern time. Yeah. And threat and uh, scripture and tradition yeah. on Tuesdays, which is at two PM Eastern time on Tuesday live. And then we played at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. So, yeah, yeah, watch those. All right, well, let me give you a blessing. Please do so, Father. May Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your time. Look forward to talking to you again in the future. God bless you, Father. All right. Oh, and one other, I do remember a plug. Definitely. Get, not for me, but for Susan Tassoni. Okay. She's called the Purgatory Lady. If you want to get more information about purgatory, look up Susan Tassoni, T-A-S-S-O-N-E. And her books on purgatory are wonderful. So Excellent. I will look that up and provide, by the time this airs, tomorrow evening, I will provide a link right down there for them to look it up. Father, Great. thank you so much. God bless you. All right. Take care.